All right, we are in week three of going through the story of the Bible. So let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for your word. Thank you for your heart, Lord, that um, we get to be part of your story. So Lord, I pray as we learn your story, we will see how you were leading towards today, towards us being a part of that. Jesus, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So I told the, I, I, last week I talked about how um, in Europe, I lived in Europe, I lived in Spain for about three and a half months, and I went to a lot of museums there. And the first time I went to a museum, I just kind of looked at all of the pictures and, and took in the whole thing. And uh, the more times that I would go to a museum, then I would begin to look at the little details. I would look at, um, you know, I talked about how one of the games that we like to play is how many dogs can we find? Because every painting in Europe, I swear, has a dog somewhere. I mean, if you're ever, if you're ever taking a trip over in Europe and you're going to museums, I promise you, look for dogs in, in the paintings. They're like everywhere. But I, I began to look at all the details. I began to look at, all right, what is the artist trying to um, accomplish here? What are they trying to say? What are they trying to do? You know, um, then if you really get into the art stuff, you look at like the brush stroke and all that stuff. That's too advanced for me. But you start, the best way in my opinion to start with art is you have to take in the whole thing. And it's the same way with the Bible. It's not that looking at all the details, God's not going to talk to you or anything along those lines, but I feel like it is better for us to understand and, and it makes a lot more sense. It's a lot more, um, it's a lot easier to kind of compare, you know, is this God, is this me, you know, and, and when you understand the whole overarching story. When you take back and you can see the whole painting for what it is, this grand story about how God wants to dwell with his people, how he, he came and lived with his people, but mankind sinned, and then God still wanted to be with his people, so he set up a people for himself and made a tent for him to live in, but that didn't go very well, so he, he came and he died for us so that we could be the dwelling place of God, and then he's going to come back and we're going to be with him, dwelling with him forever. This overarching story of, and how we got there, I think, really helps. And um, I think you guys have been enjoying this. So we're going to go on to week three. You guys are still showing up. So either you're just checking it off your list or, or you're enjoying it. So let's talk about the story of the Bible week three. You can put me up on the screen. I apologize for any typos. So God's name, just a short recap, God's name is Yahweh. That's right there what it looks like in Hebrew. Yahweh means he is. He is. He is who he is. There's, there's no one like him. There's none beside him. This is why the angels in Revelation sing, holy, holy, holy is the one who was and is and is to come. God created heaven and earth, bringing order out of chaos and light out of darkness. God made a garden where he physically dwelled with Adam and Eve. And, you know, that's all we know. They might have had kids by then, but we don't know. That's where he, he physically dwelled with mankind, though. And that's what he intended to do. A first angelic rebel deceived Adam and Eve into disobeying God. So God set up his garden, set up his world, was living with them, and basically said, hey, I have one rule. And the one rule is, don't eat from this tree. Well, here comes Satan. Here comes a, a fallen or a rebellious angel, and he says, hey, you should eat from that tree. And humans were like, okay. So that's what we did. Adam and Eve brought sin into the world through disobedience and were cast out of the garden. Then we have some angels rebel, mankind rebels, and God floods the earth to start anew. Man rebelled and angels rebelled again after the flood. So God disinherited the nations because that's what they asked for. When um, the nations built the Tower of Babel, they built a tower in Babylon, and they basically said, hey, we want to be our own boss. We don't want you. We want to control you. You know, you don't get to say how I live. And God was like, fine, if that's what you want, you guys, you know, go off and do your own thing. And I'm going to win you back someday, but I'm going to let you do what you want to do because that's what you want. God doesn't force anyone to follow him. 
So God makes a covenant with a man named Abraham. He's like, I'm going to find a people for my, uh, myself. And he miraculously moves in Abraham and his wife, Sarah, to give them offspring because they were too old to have kids. They have an offspring. His name is Isaac. And Isaac has a son named Jacob. Jacob wrestles with God physically for an entire night until God blessed him. And God then, after the wrestling match, uh, can you imagine wrestling Jesus? That'd be kind of crazy, but Jacob did it. And God changed Jacob's name to Israel. So Jacob, Israel, then goes on and has 12 sons. Now, pay attention to these. These are going to be on the test. Reuben, Simeon, Levi. I'm just kidding. I could not get the, if you need, if, if like, you came to me and were like, give me all 12. I would, if I got them all, I'd be lucky. I'll be honest. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. We're going to learn about Joseph today as we get to where the Israelites end up in Egypt. So each one of these 12 tribes, they are what are called the Israelites because Jacob's name was changed to Israel. So God is about to speak to Joseph and use him to save his family. So new stuff. Here we go. Ready? All right. Joseph saves his family. After some time, Joseph, Jacob's second youngest son, who is now 17, has a dream. He gathered his brothers and said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. So they're binding up, uh, you know, Plants for harvest. Uh, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to mine. His brothers already didn't like Joseph. Joseph was, you know, Jacob's favorite. He got the coat and he, you know, the, the multicolored coat, which color was expensive. And, um, you know, he was just, he was Jacob's favorite. And so Joseph dreams another dream. And told it to his brothers and his parents. Then Joseph dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold the sun, the moon. Apparently we need to say behold more in our, our statements because that's what they do. But behold the sun, the moon. I don't know why I said that. I just thought it was interesting. They always say behold. <laughs> and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. So everyone's a little bit upset with Joseph at this point. Be careful who you share your words of the Lord with. His brothers became so jealous of Joseph that they plotted to kill him. So they made a plan, but instead they decided, hey, instead of killing him, why don't we make some money off of it? So they sell Joseph into slavery, and they tell their father that Joseph had been killed by some wild animals. Meanwhile, Joseph ends up enslaved in Egypt to a man named Potiphar. While Joseph served Potiphar's wife, the Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. And he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in the house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So things are going well. God has turned what was evil for good. He makes good for all, of the, for all those who love him, right? Uh-oh, there we go. But after some time, however, Potiphar's wife began to desire Joseph and tried to seduce him. Joseph refused, and Potiphar's wife set Joseph up. Joseph ended up being thrown into prison where Joseph met Pharaoh's chief cupbearer and chief baker who had been thrown into prison for committing an offense against Pharaoh. We don't really know what, but while in prison, the two officers had their own dreams but did not understand them. Joseph interpreted their dreams. Both men 
dreamed about what Pharaoh would do to them. The chief cupbearer would be forgiven and continue serving Pharaoh while the chief baker would be sentenced to death. It took place exactly as Joseph had predicted. The chief cupbearer, however, forgot about Joseph. But the Lord prospered Joseph even in prison, with Joseph being put in charge of all the prisoners. After two years, Pharaoh dreamed a dream and did not understand the interpretation. Pharaoh saw seven healthy cows standing by the Nile River and seven more ugly and thin cows. Pharaoh then had a second dream, much like the second, or much like the first one. Pharaoh called for his magicians and wise men in the morning, but no one could interpret the dreams. The chief cupbearer went, oh, hey, now I remember. Joseph, he interpreted a dream for me while I was in prison. And he goes and he tells Pharaoh. Pharaoh calls Joseph, and Joseph interprets the dream for Pharaoh. Egypt would undergo seven years of plentiful harvest, followed by a worldwide famine for the next seven years. Just as Joseph had spoken, seven years of bountiful harvest and seven years of famine occurred. During that time, Joseph was made second in command over all of Egypt. Joseph instructed the Egyptians to store food to prepare for the famine, and they filled their storehouses. Because of the famine, Joseph's family needed food. You know, the local Walmart was out, all right? So they heard there was food in Egypt. So Jacob sends Joseph's 10 older brothers. What were their names? No, I'm just kidding. To get food, keeping Joseph's youngest brother behind. When the older brothers, the ones who had sold Joseph into slavery, came to Egypt, they did not recognize Joseph. Joseph asked them about his family and sent them to get their youngest brother. Joseph's first dream came true on the return trip. His brothers bowed down to him. Joseph revealed who he was and that he had forgiven his brothers. Yahweh had used what his brothers did to save Joseph's family. Joseph sent for his parents to come and live in Egypt, where, they were, where there was plenty of food. Joseph's second dream came true as Joseph's father and mother bowed before him when they arrived in Egypt. On the, I always put questions on your bulletin so you can go home and ponder. Um, we also use those uh, questions in small groups. And one of the, the questions that I've had for the last three weeks is, do you see Jesus in any of this? One of the things that I really encourage you to ask as you're reading through the Bible is, do I see Jesus? Do I see something pointing to Jesus in what I have just read? Joseph's a really good example of it because Joseph is a really big hint at what God has planned for us. If we look at the story of Joseph, Joseph leaves his home and is sent into a foreign land where He is falsely accused of a crime. Because he is falsely accused, he is tried and he is found guilty and he is put into the prison. In the prison, he is made in charge of all the prisoners until the king calls him out and makes him second in command. Basically, it says in the Bible, he basically is Pharaoh. The only thing that Pharaoh's got over him is Pharaoh's got the throne. Well, that's the the gospel. That's the gospel. Jesus left heaven, left his heavenly dwelling, and became man and lived here. He was an alien. He, this wasn't his home. He created it, but it wasn't where he was from. And he said many times, like, I'm from above, right? Well, he was falsely accused of a crime. He was falsely accused of blasphemy. And because he was falsely accused, he was hung on a cross where he was thrown into what Paul calls the prisons, the, 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 the underworld. And Paul also tells us, quoting Psalm, I think 86, but don't quote me on that part, quotes a psalm where it says that Jesus led the host of captives free. And when he rose from the dead, when he was taken out of the prison, he provided salvation for his family, us, you and me. You see how it parallels Joseph's story. Not all the details, but the overarching story. It points to what God's plan is because God had a plan all along. 
When Joseph's family arrived in Egypt, he convinced Pharaoh to let his family stay in a place called Goshen. There, it's in northern, uh, northern Egypt. There, Joseph's family thrived. After some time, Jacob became ill and called Joseph to bless him. Joseph now had two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. These names are, are important. I know that it's like, oh my gosh, I have to remember these names. But Manasseh and Ephraim, who came with Joseph to see Jacob. Jacob spoke to them about Yahweh and blessed them. Jacob then adopted Manasseh and Ephraim as his own to receive an inheritance in the land God had promised Abraham all those years ago. I'll let you know, the reason why these are important, whoa, the reason why these are important is if you're reading through the Bible, you get into the Psalms, you get into the prophets, you know, you get towards the end of the Old Testament, you're going to see where the prophets are going to be like, oh, Ephraim, why did you do this? Oh, Manasseh, why did you do this? And what they're talking about is eventually, and we're going to get to it in the story, Israel has a civil war. So Israel has a northern part and a southern part. The northern part often gets called Israel, but it's also called Manasseh and Ephraim, where the southern part is called Judah. So if you're, if you're you know, I don't know where you're reading in the Bible, if you're starting over in Genesis and going through, but when you get to it and you're like, who is this Ephraim? Who is this Manasseh? It's northern Israel. Make sense? Some of you say it makes sense. All right. The rest of you will get to it eventually. Jacob passed away. And his children thrived, having large families, because they were descendants of Jacob, whose name was also called Israel. They were called the Israelites. Make sense? The Israelites lived in Egypt for hundreds of years and grew large in number. New pharaohs had come and gone, and the newest pharaoh did not like how large the Israelites had become. To prevent Israel from amassing an army and taking over Egypt, Pharaoh enslaved the Israelites. This, however, did not stop the Israelites from growing, so Pharaoh ordered every male baby to be killed. Well, the reason why the males are killed is because the males grow up to be soldiers, and that's not a good thing in, in Pharaoh's eyes. So let's talk about Moses, introduced to a new character, Moses, an Israelite woman a descendant of Levi, hid her newborn son in an ark and placed the ark in the Nile River to give her baby a chance to live. Pharaoh's daughter found the baby boy as the ark floated down the river. She adopted the baby as her own and named him Moses, which means draw out, for she drew the child out of the water. One day, when Moses had grown up, we don't get anything about teenager Moses, just adult Moses. He went out to his people and looked on their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Moses thought he had gotten away with it, but, when, but had been seen committing this murder. When Pharaoh learned of the murder, Pharaoh sought to kill Moses. So Moses fled into the wilderness. I'm just going to change that now. <laughs> as Moses fled, he met a priest of Yahweh. Moses served the priest as a shepherd and protector of his house. He married one of the priest's daughters. Many years later, Moses was tending the flock, and the angel of, the, of Yahweh appeared to Moses in a bush that was on fire but did not burn away. In Exodus 3, 3, it says, And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight. Why is this bush not burning? When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take off your sandals for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. 
And I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. And to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land. A land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, all the ites. Moses had many questions. He didn't want to return to Egypt. After Moses made excuse after excuse, Yahweh finally tells Moses, enough, you're going. But because Moses did not speak well, Aaron, Moses' brother, would assist him. Moses would be the political leader and Aaron would be the high priest. War takes place now. War against the gods of Egypt, spiritual warfare on earth. One of the things that um, I've gotten asked, and it's a good question. Um, by the way, I love, I love questions. If you have questions, send them to me. Um, the New Testament doesn't shy away at all from demons, from um, spiritual warfare, you know, the whole armor of God kind of thing, because we're fighting against the principalities of darkness and in the heavenly places and, and all that stuff. And people, if you read through, you're like, wait, why does the language kind of change when you get to the New Testament? And the truth is it actually doesn't really. It's just we don't know exactly how the... We haven't always been taught how the Old Testament writers wrote spiritual warfare and wrote about demons. And we're going to get to probably the demon stuff next week. Um, but... Moses and Aaron are going to come to Pharaoh and basically say, uh, I'll, I'll read it. <laughs> Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and they said to Pharaoh, thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, release my people so they may hold a festival for me in the desert. And Pharaoh said, who is Yahweh that I should listen to his voice to release Israel? I do not know Yahweh and also I will not release Israel. In Egypt, they did not serve Yahweh. Instead, they have their own gods, some of the same rebellious sons of God we spoke of last week. Egypt had a pantheon of gods, and Pharaoh himself was believed to be one of these gods. It was Pharaoh's job as a god to Egypt to keep chaos away from Egypt and ensure the Nile provided water for their livestock and fields. When Pharaoh said, who is Yahweh that I should listen to his voice? I do not know Yahweh. Pharaoh was challenging Yahweh, proclaiming himself to be superior. Because of Moses and Aaron, Pharaoh made life more demanding for the Israelites. Yahweh told Moses to warn Pharaoh that if he didn't let Yahweh's people go, he would war against them and their gods. On their gods, Numbers 33, 4 says, on their gods also Yahweh executed judgments. So in the Old Testament, when you read through the plagues of Egypt, you're reading spiritual warfare take place. Pharaoh still refused to submit to the one true God, Yahweh. Yahweh kept his word and put 10 plagues on the people of Egypt. Yahweh struck the Nile, turning it into blood. He caused frogs, gnats, flies, and locusts to swarm the land and destroy their crops. He caused the livestock to die and the Egyptians to have painful boils. The Lord caused hail and lightning to fall on Egypt. Each and every plague was explicitly aimed at one of Egypt's gods. If you go on YouTube and you type in like Old Town Spiritual Warfare and the Plagues, you'll find uh, a teaching I did last year on it in much detail, but every one of the 10 plagues is aimed at one of the gods of Egypt. This is spiritual warfare taking place on earth. For the ninth plague, Yahweh blotted out the sun. The Egyptians foremost God was, was represented by the sun, but it was Yahweh who created the sun on the fifth day of creation. And this God was no match for him. After every plague, Moses would go to Pharaoh and ask if he had enough. If Pharaoh would only let the Israelites go, the plagues would stop. But for Pharaoh, that would mean admitting he was not in control, that Yahweh was most high, and that he and his gods could not stand against him. Pharaoh hardened his heart, and Yahweh poured out his judgment against Pharaoh. 
The 10th plague would be the most severe, the death of every firstborn in the land of Egypt. When Pharaoh died, his firstborn son would rule Egypt as the god of the Nile. But Yahweh is merciful. To save their sons, Egyptians and Israelites alike would have to do one thing, take a lamb and slaughter it. They were to take the lamb and prepare it as a meal in honor of Yahweh. They would take the blood and put the blood on the doorposts. Yahweh himself would pour out his judgment that night against Egypt, but any doorpost that he saw blood on would cause the Lord to pass over the house and spare the firstborn son. That's why we call Easter time Passover. In the morning, Egypt woke to the terror that, was, that Moses was not lying. Among the dead was Pharaoh's firstborn son, the heir to the throne, and the next god of Egypt. Pharaoh commanded Moses to take his people and leave immediately. As they left, not only did Israelites go, but a great multitude of Egyptians and even other nations followed. The Egyptians gave the Israelites all the treasures they owned, precious metals and precious stones. But Pharaoh changed his mind as the Israelites were on their way out of Egypt. He could not let these slaves go. It would destroy his reputation. He, he was supposed to be a god after all. It would destroy their economy and he would be ruined. Pharaoh chased after them with his army and the Israelites found themselves with an army on one side and a sea on the other. But Moses said to the people, you must not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of Yahweh, which he will accomplish for you today. Because the Egyptians whom you see today, you will never see again. Yahweh will fight for you and you must be quiet. He fights for us, church. Like if you're going through the spiritual battles, you know, someday we'll do a teaching on the book of Jude. The book of Jude is about let God fight your battles. Don't raise yourself up too high and deal with stuff that we are not called to deal with. Let him fight. You keep your eyes on him and let him deal with the stuff. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness. Notice the darkness there. And it lit up the night with one coming near the other all night. So then the darkness gets lit up. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a well to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning, watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavy. And the Egyptians said, let us flee before from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Before the Egyptians could flee, the water fell back on the Egyptian army. Just as Yahweh had brought life out of chaos at creation, he split the seas and brought forth dry ground for the Israelites to cross. The sea swallowed up Pharaoh's forces, delivering Israel from their enemies, from their enemy and their slavery. There's a lot of very similar themes in the Exodus and creation. We talked about how in Genesis 1, it was, the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And out of that chaos and darkness, God brings life and light. Well, the same elements are in the Exodus. You have this darkness, but then you have this, this God himself making the light, being fire and giving light. And then you have the waters and Israel can't cross. And what happens? A wind comes and separates the sea and they, there's land brought out from the waters and Israel crosses safely into um, the Sinai desert. So you have a lot of this same kind of imagery going on. And the, the image is the lesson, the, the theology 
uh, goes back to what we've been saying. God is the God that brings light and life out of chaos and darkness. And if you are in chaos and darkness, if you're here today and you find yourself surrounded by the enemy, he is the one who fights our battles and he is the one who brings life and light to us. So hold on to him. Pray, seek him, worship him, and let him do what only he can do. This is where we're going to end today. A covenant is made. God will dwell with his people again. Israel marched to a mountain called Sinai. Because of the number of people and the wilderness they were in, God caused manna to rain from heaven. Manna literally means, what is it? Every morning as food for the Israelites, the manna was round and it was white. It was a round white grain and could be made into a cake that tasted like honey. While Israel was at the mountain, Yahweh took Israel to be, I'll give you a a little lesson. I don't, I didn't have time for this last service. So you're going to get some good stuff. Oftentimes when we think about the manna, we think about how we, I kind of pictured like you go outside and there's like a loaf of bread there. That's not what it was, though. It tells us that it was like a seed. It was a grain. And they actually had to take it and they had to make something out of it. Sometimes God gives us manna and asks us to process it and make it into something. It would be really nice if God was just like, here's a loaf of bread that tastes like honey. But oftentimes he invites us into a process. He says, here's the manna, here's the grain, and I'm going to teach you how to process it and make it into food. So if you're wondering, like, Lord, this isn't exactly what I was asking for, ask him, Lord, have you given me manna? Have you given me something that I'm supposed to process, that I'm supposed to cultivate, that I'm supposed to help transform into the finished product? That was really good, I thought. (laughs) He made a covenant. (laughs) Thank you, Ben. While Israel was at the mountain, Yahweh took Israel to be his people. He made a covenant with them, and Israel agreed. He gave Moses a set of laws that would separate the Israelite people from the surrounding nations. If they were to represent Yahweh as his people, they could not live sinful lives like the nations did. Among the many laws, Yahweh commanded Israel to take a Sabbath. Yahweh had made everything in creation in six days and rested on the seventh. Yahweh told Israel that should they work for six days, that they should work for six days and rest on the seventh. Yahweh promised he would bless them as his people served him, tithed, which means bring a tenth of their wages, crops, livestock, etc., and brought offerings. They would accomplish, in fact, it should be say, Yahweh, would accomplish more in six days than the surrounding nations in seven. God does this. He still does it in people's lives. In the Old Testament, God didn't give the law for Israel to be saved. That's not what it was. It wasn't follow the Ten Commandments and these other 600 laws and you'll be saved. The law was given in if you believe that Yahweh is God, if you want to be part of, if you want to be his people, if you want to be in his family, then this is what your life should look like. It's a lot like Christianity. We cannot earn, it's, it's, it's one book, it's one narrative. Neither in the Old Testament nor in the New Testament can you earn your salvation. It is a gift freely given. But receiving that gift means that we need to live different. And that's what the law is about. So when you're reading the law, don't read it. Now, it did become that in Jesus' day. That's what the Jews taught. But, But that's not what it says in the scriptures. In the scriptures, the law is a result of what our hearts should look like if an Israelite were to follow Yahweh. And now we have the new covenant. So Yahweh gives them instructions for a tent, a tabernacle. This tabernacle would serve as Yahweh's home on earth. The tabernacle would contain three rooms. The outermost room would be a courtyard 
where Israelites could come with an offering and have a meal with God. There would be an inner room called the holy place where a lampstand would burn olive oil 24-7. Fresh bread and wine would be set on the table. This would show the Israelites that Yahweh was home. There would also be an altar that burned sweet-smelling incense day and night. This would be the prayers of Yahweh, the prayers of the people being brought before Yahweh. Then there was a final room. This room would be separated and no one could enter. This room would be called the most holy place or the holy of holies. It would be where Yahweh's glory, his manifest presence on earth would dwell. The most holy place would be guarded by a thick veil, preventing anyone from accidentally wandering in. The Israelites would fashion a box of wood and gold inside the room and call it the Ark of the Covenant. This Ark would house two identical stone tablets with the terms of the covenant on them. So I know that a lot of times in our depictions of them, we have one that has five commandments and one that has the other five. They're actually two identical. They're two identical tablets. And it's kind of like if you've ever written on a duplicate kind of thing where you have like the white copy and the pink copy and the yellow copy where you write on the first one and then it writes on the other ones. That's kind of the same thing that's going on. So one copy is Israel's who said, we agree to the terms of this covenant. And then one copy was the Lord's who said, I agree to the terms of this covenant. The tabernacle was decorated like the Garden of Eden with trees, fruit, vibrant colors, and gold. Pictures sewn into the veil of cherubim, throne guardians, guarded the most holy place. The purpose of this covenant and this tent was not to give Israel rules and make their lives difficult. Yahweh longed to be back in the garden, how he had made the man and woman. The law and the tent were Yahweh's signs that he was returning the world to that garden. He would start by making himself a home and dwelling with his people, just like he did all those years ago. Exodus 29, 45 says, I will dwell among the people of Israel, and I will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. Tabernacle is the Hebrew word mishkan. And dwell, uh, it comes from the word to dwell, which is the Hebrew word shukan. If you've ever heard of shekinah, that's what it kind of comes from, which means to dwell or settle in a place. The tabernacle is also called the house of God. By the way, this Wednesday, come on out for our revelation class. You don't have to be, you don't have to have attended any other class for this week to make sense. We're going to be talking about this. It's going to be super cool. The fact that God dwells with us, you're not going to want to miss it. The garden, the tabernacle, and you. When God made the garden, it was his shakan, his dwelling place with mankind. When man sinned, they were cast out of the garden. This was not God's will. He went out of his way to make a people for himself. He then went out of his way to draw these people to himself. Lastly, he had them make a mishkan, a tabernacle, a dwelling place for him to live with his people. Today, there is no tabernacle, there is no temple that's made by human hands where God resides. Instead, the New Testament calls you and I the dwelling place of God. The Greek words used in the New Testament is the same word used in the Old Testament for tabernacle and house. Just to give you an example, and we'll talk more about this Wednesday, so come on out. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 2 says, For we know that if the tent, our body, that is our earthly home, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. Now that's super beautiful and I love it, but here's how you can literally translate, just to give you an idea of how often the New Testament authors talk about the tabernacle. 
This is how you could translate this verse. And this is how important Paul and I want you to know that you are the temple of God. You're the tabernacle now if you believe in Jesus. You could literally translate this, for we know that if the tabernacle that is our earthly tabernacle is destroyed, we have a tabernacle from God. A tabernacle not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, for in this tabernacle we groan, longing to put on our heavenly tabernacle. Someone say tabernacle, okay? All of the rules and laws, there's a lot of rules and laws about the tabernacle. You know, you have to do these sacrifices and you have to clean this and do that. And make sure that if you break something, these are the things that you have to do if you break something and, and so on and so forth. And those aren't to make Israel's life challenging, even though it, it did make it a little bit more complicated. The purpose was God wanted to dwell with his people. He wanted to literally tabernacle with them. He wanted to go with them. He wanted to travel with them. He wanted to do life with them. When they went out to battle, he wanted to go and fight for them. When they had questions, he wanted to answer them. When they had prayers, he wanted to hear them. Well, now, as I said, there's no human-made place where God's glory dwells. The place where God dwells is you. Which should change how we live. Not because God doesn't want you to have fun. Not because God doesn't just wants you to be a boring Christian and you can't do this and you can't do that. The reason why we need to be holy, the reason why God wants us to be holy is because if we aren't holy, He can't properly use us. And I'm getting a little bit ahead in the story, but Israel would begin doing horrible things in that tabernacle. They'd let the lights go out. They wouldn't keep the bread on the table. They'd let the incense go out. They'd begin um, doing adultery in there. They'd be... Um, They potentially even would sacrifice kids in there. And so God left. He said, I can't deal with this. I gave you these laws so that you could keep this place pure and holy, set apart. He's saying the same thing about us. If you go on and you read in 2 Corinthians 5, it's going to talk about how you can't mix the tabernacle with sin. Not because God's a prude and he he hates you and all that stuff, because he wants to do life with you. And if we continue to let sin infest our lives, he can't do everything that he wants to do. He wants to speak to you. Just like the the lamp was supposed to be on 24-7. He wants to be with you 24-7. From the moment that you wake up to the time you wake up the next morning. He wants there to be fresh bread. Remember what he said, I am the bread of life. If anyone who is hungry, come to me and I will give them the bread of life. Just like the prayers went up symbolically in the incense all day and all night. You can pray anytime, anywhere. And he hears you because he has made you his tabernacle. So I encourage you, talk to him about that. Ask him, Lord, how can I be a better tent, a better house, a better tabernacle for you? What do I need to change in my life? I promise you, if you will do life with him, it's gonna be fun, I promise you. And I promise you that in him are peace and joy and love that you cannot get in the things of the world. Let's stand as we close in prayer. Lord, I I thank you for who you are. I pray, Lord, as I've prayed before, I thank you that we get to be part of your story. So Lord, as 
a part of, as people who are a part of your story, I pray that you would make us holy, that you would speak to us, that you would give us fresh bread, that you would satisfy us. Lord, I pray for healing for all who need it. I pray for deliverance from sin and and thoughts. I pray that you would remove unforgiveness and pride from our hearts. I pray that you would remake us into your image. Lord, we need you. So we set our eyes upon you. Lord, heal everyone who needs healing. All those who are sick, bring life and light to those who find themselves in chaos and darkness. Lord, you are enough. Bless your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have a good night. Hope to see you tonight for prayer or see you Wednesday. Stay warm and uh, go Lions.